juggling between the Crips and the Bloods, a known gangbanger, drug dealer turned drug addict, nearly sentenced to three to 15 years behind bars. My name is Clifford Grisso, and this is my testimony. At the age of 12 years old, I was in a gang-infested neighborhood. Drug dealing, gang banging was something of the norm. Um, I grew up in this neighborhood, pretty much a regular kid just like everybody else. But as anybody who grows up in their environment, I was slowly becoming a product of my environment. There was a lot of gang members in my neighborhood. Many of them were older than me, of course. But they were training the younger people to get into these gangs. And so being the kid that I was and falling under the peer pressure of gang banging and drug dealing and seeing that life as something desirable because of the music that I was always listening to, I started to get more interested in joining this gang. And a friend of my brother's who was part of this gang started to recruit me. And it was at that time, at the age of 13 years old, that I decided to go under his flag and be a part of the Crip gang. In Brooklyn, New York, I was raised. And of course, a lot of people know Brooklyn for all the pain and all the suffering that goes there, especially in the urban context. I was one of those people that had fell into this trap. And so I began to look at the Crip life as the good life. Gang banging, drug dealing, smoking weed, and doing all kinds of things that no one my age should have been dealing with. But I thought that was the life that was to live. I thought it was the ideal thing. And so it was at a young age I started breaking into people's houses, burglaries, robberies, holding people at knife point, having my friends holding guns and doing all those things were normal to me. I was cutting school. I didn't have a regard for parents. I didn't have a regard for authority figures, and I was very rebellious. I had no clue that God had a plan for me. I had no clue that in all of these things that were going on, that God was watching high and looking down low. And so at the age of about 13, I was already fighting, doing all these things. And as I grew older, I started getting deeper and deeper into gang culture. I even became a leader of some sort. And as I became a leader, my job was pretty much evangelizing, you know, evangelizing for the gang and getting other younger recruits to join. I did not know that the devil was using me to bring other people into this gang and using me very effectively, I might add. And so as the devil was using me to recruit more people, my name became more famous. People began to know who I was. And I thought I was the man. I thought that this is the ideal life. I thought that this was the life that I was meant to live. But that was a lie. And so by the age of 16, I was crip. But then because of a high school that I went to that was full of bloods, I was peer pressured to even go into that gang. It was a suicide mission. What was I thinking? I don't know at the time. But all I know was that the devil had a plan to destroy me. And because another friend of mine who was part of the Bloods was trying to recruit me into the Bloods, guess what? I was claiming blood and crip at the same time. This was a suicide mission. This was unheard of. And this could have brought my death so easily. There were many times that I was held at gunpoint, but I remember when I was at school in Brooklyn, New York, and I was held at gunpoint. They put a gun to my head and a gun to my side. And I said to myself, surely this is my last day of life. There's no way I'm going to get out of this situation. There's no way I'm going to be able to escape. I have finally, it has finally caught up with me, and now I'm going to die. And so as I was gun-butted three times in my face, and me thinking in my mind that I was going to die for sure, I was robbed and I was told to never sell drugs in that neighborhood again. You see, me, I was the type of kid who had no regards for authority even if you were gang authority. And so I would sell drugs in any neighborhood. I would gang bang in any neighborhood. I would wear my flag and rep my gang in any neighborhood that I went to. I was rebellious and nobody could tell me anything. And even after that day, that near death experience where I was almost shot to death, 
I still didn't learn. I had committed a burglary. And in this burglary that I committed, while I was in the woman's house, she walked into the house while I was there. And then as I was there, I tried to escape the house, but while I was trying to escape, she tried to fight me. She tried to keep me, and she was yelling out for the police. And so I had no choice but to fight my way out of that house. As I fought my way out of the house and I went to my home, that was at, it was at that moment that I realized that my wallet had fell out, my, out of my pocket. And my wallet had all my information in it. And I said, oh my God, I am finally caught. My time has run out. My rebelliousness has finally caught up with me. And so as I was home, the police came knocking on the door not too many, not too many hours later. And so my mom was there, my, my aunt was there, my, my grandmother was there, and everyone was outside. It was during the summer. And all I can see is the tears that were running down my mom's face. How my mom just felt like she did all that she could and still this happened to her son. You see, my mom was a prayer warrior. She was a woman missionary. She loved the Lord, and she prayed very fervently for me. But I never would love to go to church. I never liked going to church. I never wanted to pray. I never wanted to, to sing. I didn't like the songs. I always wanted to listen to rap music, and I wanted to do my own thing. And so I remember being arrested right in front of my mom and seeing my mom cry. And guess what? Even at that moment, I was heartless. No tears fell down my face. And so as I was taken to jail, and I went before the judge, and I was told by my lawyer that I could be possibly sentenced to 3 to 15 years in jail, my heart completely sank. I was only 16 years old. Now, could you imagine being only 16 years old, being charged with burglary, and being told that you might be sentenced to 3 to 15 years in jail, and that you would have to hire a lawyer? I thought my life was surely over, but God had a plan. It was at the moment that all these things were going on, my mom called a few, of, a few friends of hers, and they began to pray with me. My sister was praying, my mom was praying, my grandmother was praying, and here I am in um, Rikers Island, not knowing what's going on on the outside, thinking I might be here for a very long time. It was as my mom was praying that the lady who I robbed, who I committed the burglary to, she called my mom's house. And it was at that moment my mom heard her over the phone, and she sounded like she was crying. She sounded very sad. And my mom asked, who am I speaking to? And the lady replied, I am the woman who put your son behind bars. And she began to apologize to my mother for what she did. And my mom could not understand why this woman would be apologizing for something I did to her. And it was at that moment, the lady began to tell my mom that God had a plan for my life. That the, the police officers were literally coming to her home every single day trying to get her to testify against me so that they can stick it to me, so that they can stick the, um, uh, my sentence to me. And it was at the moment the lady said, the Lord spoke to her. And, told my, and she told my mom that God had a great plan for my life, that she didn't know who I was or who my mom was, but God had a great plan for, for my life, and she apologized for getting me locked up. And so it was at that moment I thought to myself, God got me out of prison. I was supposed to spend 3 to 15 years, but I didn't even spend 3 weeks. And I was let go with probation just because this woman did not testify. And her sole reason was because God revealed to her that he had a plan for my life. It was at that moment that God became something real to me. Because before then, I said I believed in God, but my actions proved that I was an atheist. I did everything against God. I rebelled against God and didn't want nothing to do with him. But it was at that moment I finally began to think to myself, maybe there is something to this God thing. Maybe there is something about God that I need to seek out because he got me out of prison. But that didn't change me. Being held at gunpoint didn't change me. Being sentenced almost to 3 to 15 years behind jail did not change me. And so I was still going through life, smoking weed, drinking liquor, going to parties, going to clubs, and being known as a gangbanger, being known as a drug dealer. I remember robbing other drug dealers. I remember that there was Rastafarians who told me, Clifford, you need to stop smoking because you smoke too much. I mean, could you believe that? A Rastafarian telling me that I smoke too much weed? 
That's how much narcotics was pumping into my system. I even got laced with, with, with angel dust inside of my weed at one point. And it was at that point that I turned from drug dealer to drug addict. My other friend, he was also laced. And he went totally crazy. We were only 17 at the time. We were in high school. This was literally our freshman year. And we were in school causing so much wreck. And could you imagine being laced with angel dust? Going completely crazy to the point where I did anything to support my habit. I was stealing money from my friends, stealing money from my family. I was stealing rent money from my father. I started selling everything out of the house just to get high. I dropped out of high school. I was a complete wreck. I hit rock bottom. Everyone gave up on me, but one person always prayed for me. It was my mom. My dad continued to support me because of my mom. And as my mom would pray, she said, Clifford, I'm not going to call you Clifford anymore. I'm going to call you Paul because God is going to call you to preach the gospel all around the world. He's going to use you the same way he used Paul. He's going to change your name, and he's going to have you preaching the gospel all around the world. Little did I know that my mom was prophesying over my life. I don't even think she understood or grasped what she was fully saying at the time. But I didn't want to hear that. I hated when my mom would call me Paul because I knew the life of Paul. And I said my name would not be mentioned with Jesus at the same time. I don't know why I hated God so much. I don't know why I decided to turn away from God because God did nothing but help me in my life. And so I remember there was another night where I was held at gunpoint. And at this time, this person looked like he was really about to kill me. And as he rolled up in his Jeep in a drive-by fashion, as he rolled up in his, dream, in his Jeep in a drive-by fashion, he pulled out his gun. And as he pulled out his gun and I was screaming, please don't shoot, don't shoot. And he began to curse at me. He began to, you know, say a lot of profanity. And I thought, for surely this was my last day. I mean, I've brushed so much face-to-face -face moments with death. I said, this has to be it. And right before this man could shoot his first bullet, my cousin, who lived in my building, came out of nowhere. And he jumped in front of me and he pulled us both backwards to the point where we both fell backwards and I hit my head on the ground. And yeah, that was painful. But when I woke up knowing that I wasn't shot and when I touched my cousin on top of me and I asked him, was he shot? He said, no. All the bullets hit the wall behind us. And where did my cousin come from? Because I had no clue that he was there. And how did he knew that I was going to get shot at? You see, that's what God did for me as well. God jumped in front of my bullet. God jumped and used my cousin to jump in front of the bullet to make sure that I didn't get shot because he had a plan. And still at this moment, I still did not fully understand. You see, I had caught a nose and a throat infection. And I began to cough up blood. And as I went to the doctor, because I felt like I was literally dying, I asked the doctor and I said, the doctor, I need a checkup because I feel like my throat is on fire. And when the doctor checked out, checked me out, he told me that if I did not stop smoking, that I was going to die. It was at that moment I said to myself, where is God? And who is God? Because there's so much gods out there. There's Buddha, there's Krishna, there's, there's Allah, there's Jesus, there's God. He's the son, he's the father. Like, I was so confused. And I really was looking for answers. And I truly believe that God knew that I was looking for answers. And I said to myself, I'm going to die. And... And so the doctor said if I continue to smoke that I was going to die because he said the lining in my esophagus was getting real thin. And he even warned me about those people who have holes in their throats and they smoke even through the hole in their throat. He said that this could happen to me. And of course, I became fearful. But what did I do when I go home? I started smoking weed again because I was addicted. I was laced with angel dust. And so I had to smoke so much just to keep my habit going, just to keep, you know, the feeling going. And going through all these situations, having my friends shot, having my friends killed, and going through all of this and knowing that my other friend is in a nut house because he got laced with the same drugs, and now he totally lost his mind. And to this day, he speaks to himself 
To this day, he talks when he's not spoken to. To this day, he just starts bursting out laughing without nobody talking to him. And here I am, able to speak before this television screen. And I'm like, God, why me? Why did you choose me? Why are you doing this in my life? And I begin to ask myself certain questions. I say, God, if I'm not crazy, if I'm not dead, if I don't have a bullet in my head like my other friend does who's locked up doing life in jail right now, if I don't have all these things, then there must be a plan for me. And I remember I was smoking the weed even after the doctor told me I was dying. Even though I felt like there was fire burning in my esophagus. Even though I knew that there was a possibility that I was going to literally die at any moment because everything was shutting down in my body. I still was smoking weed. And I remember smoking weed in the basement of my apartment complex next to a garbage room. And looking at the garbage woman saying, this is all I am. I'm garbage. I'm nothing else but garbage. And that's why I'm smoking next to this garbage room. I'm coughing out blood and I'm still smoking. I said, what is wrong with me? And it was at that moment that I said an arrogant prayer. It wasn't a prayer of trying to find God or trying to seek God. It wasn't a prayer of saying, God, please help me. It was a prayer saying, literally, God, if you're going to save me, save me now. Because I'm dying. So what are you going to do about it? You say you got this plan for me. You tell me through all these kind of people who prophesy and say they're prophets and how I'm going to be this great man of God. You spoke to my mom and say, I'm going to preach the gospel all around the world. If this is you, then what are you going to do? Because I'm dying now. Guess I'm not going to fulfill this prophecy. I guess I'm not going to live up to what my mom said I was going to do. <laughs> and let me tell you something. You can't test God. <laughs> you can't put God to the test and think he won't come through. If you put God to the test, God will come through and he would not just show up, but he will show out. And it was at that moment that I was talking to God that way. About three minutes later, as I was smoking on the weed, as I was smoking on the blunt, and I heard a voice in my head say to me, Clifford, I am calling you and I have a plan for you to preach the gospel all around the world. At first I thought, I'm going crazy. I'm smoking too much weed. It finally got to me. I was literally there in my seat. I mean, I was standing there smoking, and I'm like, I'm going crazy. I'm really dying now because I'm hearing voices. This was the first time I ever heard an audible voice speak to me. I said, this can't, I, I'm losing my mind. And then it was at that moment I said, no, nah, I can't be. I'm not, I'm not losing my mind. I'm, I'm hearing this voice. I'm not that high. I just started smoking. I'm like, it can't be the weed. I said, it can't be me. I don't want to preach the gospel all around the world. Like, how can me, a drug dealer, a gangbanger, a drug addict, a drop out of, I dropped out of high school. I had nothing going on for me. I totally hit rock bottom, you know? And even through all of this, I was a victim of witchcraft. I was a victim of witchcraft. They did voodoo after me. I'm from a Haitian family, and so that is very common in Haitian families. I was a victim of witchcraft. They tried to kill me with voodoo so many times. They tried to kill my, my, my mom. They tried to kill my family with voodoo so many times. And so I was going through all of this at once, and I just could not understand why me. And so I said, I can't possibly be chosen to preach the gospel all around the world. I am a total mess. But I didn't understand that God was taking my mess to be used as a message for a mess age. <laughs> I didn't know that God was going to take my mess and turn it into a message. And so it was at that moment I said, okay, it can't be the weed. I said, it can't be me. I don't want to preach the gospel. I'm not qualified for this. I said, it can't be the devil. I said, why would the devil want me to preach the gospel? Because even though I didn't fully believe in God and I had my doubts, I had some clue. I had a clue about God, and I knew that God wanted good for me, but I just didn't want that good at that time. I wanted to live life the way I wanted to live life. And all I could remember is my mom telling me that God was going to catch me by the throat. She always told me that. She said, you smoke so much weed, God's just going to take me by the throat, just like he did the Apostle Paul and smack him off his high horse. And so because of my throat infection and my nose infection, I said, wow, this has to be what my mom said about God catching me at the throat and taking me and putting me on the wall like a big bully ticks you and puts you on the wall and said, you're going to do my will. You're going to do what I tell you to do. And so it was at that moment I said, it can't be the weed, it can't be the devil, it can't be um, me, because I don't want to do that. I said, it has to be God. I said, God, if this is you, I said, help me get off these drugs. I said, help me go back to school and get the grades that I used to get, because I was a straight-A student. And I said, whenever I speak, let people know that it's not me speaking, 
but you speaking through me. Because I said to myself, I can't go back to these gang members and tell them that I'm just getting out of the gang. That was suicide. And so I say, God, give me a message to bring to these gang members. Give me a message to bring to these drug dealers. Give me a message to bring to the world. Because you said, I'm going to preach this gospel all around the world. I said, show me that you are truly with me so that when I go back out there, they'll know that it is you speaking through me and not me speaking of my own accord. And it was at that moment that I threw away the weed. And I threw away a blunt that was this long. Trust me. I used to smoke them till they were that small. I would smoke it until it burned my lip. And so throwing a blunt this long away was an act of God by itself. And I remember saying, God, I need you to heal me now. I was home and I was coughing out blood still and people were praying for me. And I said, God, I know that, that, that you can do it. I believe you now. I trust you. I heard you speak to me and I'm trusting in you now. And it was at that moment the Lord told me, I want you to go to your church and I want you to pray. And so it was a Tuesday night prayer. Now, I want you to understand that when I went to this Tuesday night prayer, everybody was looking at me very weirdly because they said, what is he doing here on a Tuesday night? They barely can get me to come on Sundays. A lot of people in the church knew me. I used to curse in the church. I, I was very disrespectful. I even used to steal money out of the collection plate. I had no regard for God. I didn't care no, I had no care for God. I didn't have no care for the house of God. I didn't care for the, the leaders of God, the pastor. I used to, I cursed people out in the middle of service. It did not matter. I was rebellious everywhere that I went. And so I remember God telling me to go to church on a Tuesday night. He said, I'm going to heal you. And I just couldn't believe it because it was the same voice. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to go. I'm just going to obey because I, I, I believe now and I'm going to put my faith to the test. And so when I was walking to the church and I finally was at the door, I heard a voice say to me, I want you to get on your knees and put your head in between your knees like Elijah did and pray to me. At this point, I'd never heard of who Elijah was. I didn't know of his story. Uh, I never heard a sermon about Elijah, but I just obeyed God and said, whatever he tells me to do, I'm going to do. And so as I got on my knees and I put my head in between my knees and I began to pray to God, I began to pray profusely. And as I began to pray, that's when I felt literally like a rushing mighty wind. It just fell right on top of me. And everybody in the church began to pray. And, and some people were speaking in tongues and some people were shouting. And, and I'm like, what is, this? What, what is going on? What are they saying? I, I had no clue of what was happening. You know, and, and, and as this was going on, the people were crying loudly and their eyes were closed. And I'm just looking around confused. But at the same time, I'm feeling the presence of God for the very first time. And I had no clue what it was. I said, wow, this has to be the presence of God. I said, this can't be nothing else. And I just began to weep uncontrollably. I've never cried like this before in my life. I had no clue that all these tears were inside of me, bottled up for so many years because I kept it in a tight shell. I kept it in a tough shell because I had to be gangster. I had to be thug. I had to be a thoroughbred. I had to be somebody that was evil and wicked and always keeping a screw face. And now here I am on this ground completely crying. And, 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 and I was just tearing and I was screaming. And, and, and I said, God, I'm so sorry. It was at that moment I began to see all my sin just flash in my head at one time as if it was on a big screen in a movie theater and I'm seeing all my sins just flashing in front of me and as I began to weep and I'm like, God, God, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. Like, I, I know what I've done and, 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 but you still, you still love me. I just, I, I could not understand that. He, he still loves me because if I'm feeling his presence after all this has happened, how can you still love me? And I began to even flatten myself on the ground. And it was at that moment my life changed because I seen something that I never thought was possible. I mean, I hear about Spider-Man and I hear about Superman and I hear about Batman. I hear about superheroes. And ever since we're young, we're hearing about Santa Claus. We're hearing about the Tooth Fairy. We're hearing about the Easter Bunny. We're hearing about all these different characters who are supposed to be these good characters who come right in the nick of time, you know, who have these abilities that human, humans don't have. We hear about X-Men and, and all these different characters from young. And so sometimes what happens, being a person that been hearing about all these characters who are powerful, I kind of put Jesus in the same category as Santa Claus. I, I put Jesus in the same category as Spider-Man and, and Superman as just a fictional character that was made up, you know, to tell a good story. 
But it was at that moment that Jesus was no longer like Spider-Man. Jesus was no longer Superman. Jesus was no longer Santa Claus. He was no longer Gulliver's Travel or, 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 or a, a story or a mystery. I literally, as I was on the floor, and I looked to the left side of me, I seen Jesus with his arms stretched out. And he was literally walking towards me. And I'm looking and I'm like, is this real? And I'm like, am I high? And I said, I'm not high, I haven't smoked. I haven't smoked no weed, I haven't drank, I haven't done anything. I'm, I said, this can't be happening. I'm rubbing my eyes and then I'm looking around the church and I'm like, is anybody seeing this with me? Am I the only person that can see Jesus? But everybody was praying real loudly and so I know they felt his presence but they did not know that he was in the room, that literally his, his presence was there. And so as I looked and he came and he stood right in front of me and I can hear his audible voice say, Clifford, do you believe in me now? And I said, yeah. I mean, he was right in front of me. I, I said, I believe in you now. I believe. And, and as I was weeping and everything like that, he says, I want you to touch my feet. And it was at that moment, I kid you not, I've never felt fear like that ever in my life. I felt like all my bones were dislocated from each other and they were just shaking. I was literally trembling. I was afraid for my life. And so as I was trembling and, and my hands were daring to touch his feet, and as I touched his feet, I couldn't believe that I touched feet. It was as if there was a physical foot there. And one of my fingers literally slipped inside the hole, and I pulled it out, and I said, oh, my God, this is real. Like, I, I said, this is actually happening. I couldn't believe my hands. I touched, and I pulled back, and I began to weep. And I heard him with a small, smooth voice. I mean, so compassionate, so loving. He said, Clifford, stand up. You're a soldier now. And I remember saying to God, no way I'm not going to stand up. There's no way I'm going to get up from this place. I need to be at your feet. I'm so dirty. I'm unworthy. I'm like, don't you see this? Don't you see that? Don't you see when I held a gun up to this woman and, and threatened to kill her little baby just for her purse? Don't you see the time where I put this person at gunpoint? Don't you see the time where I stabbed this person? Don't you see the time where I ran in this woman's house and I burglarized her home and I had to fight her to get out? Like, don't you see all the people? that I put in these gangs and led them into destruction and some of them are still in jail right now because I'm the one who recruited them into this gang. Don't you see all of that? How can you still tell me to stand up in front of you? And so I refused and God, and then he disappeared. And as he disappeared, I began to cry even more. And I knew he was in the room because it was as if somebody put the volume down on the prayers and the praise went from real loud to dimming out. I said, oh my God. I said, I just seen Jesus. I, I, I seen him. How can I doubt him anymore? How can I say he's not real? But I then began to cry because I said, how evil, how messed up can I possibly be for God to stand in front of me and for me to have seen him and still disobey him? He told me to stand and I refused to. I disobeyed God right in front of him. I couldn't believe that. And it was at that moment, as I was contemplating these things and, and asking God for forgiveness for disobeying him to his face, that's when the praise went up all of a sudden again. And I said, oh, my God, he's going to come back. And I did not want to see him. I was, I was afraid. I said, God, I don't want to see you anymore. It's okay. I'm okay. I'm done. I don't need to see you again. I'm all right. Because I was so afraid. I said, I had enough of you for the day. I really did not want to see him again. And that was that, it was at that moment I felt the presence of God again, the same manner it was from before. And when I felt it, I looked to the left of me again. And this time it wasn't Jesus. There was this old lady in my church. Her name was Sister Giselle. We called her Sejizel because we were from a Haitian church. And I seen Sejizel or Sister Giselle just literally arms stretched out eyes closed, and she was walking to me towards my direction just like Jesus was. And I'm looking at her very weird because I feel Jesus, but I see her face. And I'm like, this is weird. And she's walking towards me in a straight way, the same way Christ did. And then she comes and she stands in front of me identically to where he stood. And then she takes these two fingers. She puts it under my hand like this. I was literally flat on the ground. 
she pulls me up to the point where I jumped out. Like, I mean, I was literally on my feet from just her lifting me up like this. Like, I was a feather, and I was so freaked out. And I was like, oh, my God, like, this is not normal. This is not, this can't be real. This woman was over 50 years old at the time. This, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger couldn't put two fingers under my hand at his prime and just lift me up like that. Just couldn't believe my eyes. I just couldn't believe it. And I looked at her, and she looked at me, and she says in Creole, she says, Compe, sans soldat kill you. And literally translated, it stand up. You're a soldier now. And all the air began to leave my body. And I fell to the ground. And for the first time in my whole life, I worshiped the Lord. I literally worshiped God. I began to see God like Isaiah did, seated on a throne, high and lifted up. His train, his glory filled the temple. And then I looked at myself, oh, wretched man, a man of unclean lips and an unclean heart. I'm like, who am I for God to appear to me out of all people? How is it that God would love me? And I, and I said to myself, like, David, what is man that thou art mindful of him? I mean, I couldn't understand why God's mind was full of me. And it was at that moment, I said, I'm a soldier now. And I stood up, and from that day, I never smoked. I wasn't smoking anymore. I wasn't drinking anymore. I dropped out of the crypts, and then I dropped out of the bloods, and I said, I can't hang with none of you guys anymore. I'm not putting my life in danger anymore for the causes of the enemy. I said, I'm no longer going to be a, a demonic evangelist recruiting young kids into this gang anymore. But I was going to start recruiting them for Jesus. I was going to start bringing them to the master of the universe, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the savior of the world. I said, I'm going to live for Christ, and I'm going to live for Christ for the rest of my life. And it was literally at that moment I was instantly healed. No more throat infection, no more nose infection. I was not coughing out blood anymore. I was completely healed, and I knew God did it. When I went back to high school, at my high school, when I went back and everybody was hearing about me and about my testimony and how God changed my life, people was getting saved, people were being delivered. Literally, a Bible study broke out in my high school. This was a secular college. This wasn't no private Christian school. This was no, you know, Christian school at all. There was barely any Christians in this school. No, and even if they were Christians, they were not claiming or proclaiming the name of God. And I said, I have to be the one to be the light in the darkness. I have to be the one to tell them about what God did. I was telling everybody, I mean, from the principals to the teachers, and people were literally crying as I shared my testimony because they knew me as the kid who, were robbing everybody, who was robbing everybody in school. I was being um, literally checked by officers at the school. I was robbing people. I was gangbanging. I was doing all these things, and they knew me as this kid. And now they're like, wait, Clifford is reading a Bible in, lunch, in the lunchroom? He He's holding a Bible study. They could not believe it. And so my testimony began to spread. And I remember how it happened. I have to share this because it all happened one day when I woke up and God was telling me, I want you to preach on the bus. And I said, no way. I'm not preaching on the bus. <laughs> like, like, do you see how they treat people on the bus at, when they're preaching? They tell them to shut up. Some people throw things at them. I said, I'm not preaching on the bus because I'm even one of those people that, you know, in New York City, people be preaching on the bus, and I see how they treat people, and I'm one of those people who tell them shut up because I'm tired. I want to get home. Like, what's up? Like, could you please just be quiet? I don't want to hear what you're saying right now. And so here I am literally taking the place of the person I was telling to shut up for a few days ago on the bus. And he's telling me to do this, and I kid you not, there was such a fire in me, and I didn't want to do it, but I wanted to do it. And so I put my hand over my mouth like this, and as I put my hand over my mouth like that, and I began to cry, it's because I literally felt like I was just going to burst out a praise to God on the bus, and I didn't want people to look at me like I was crazy. And so this would happen all the way to school. And literally, as I got in front of my high school in Brooklyn, New York, I stood in front of the high school and seen all these kids, literally, my school was like one of the largest um, high schools in Brooklyn, and it had all these kids in front of there, 
getting ready to go through metal detectors because that's how schools were in Brooklyn. You had to go through metal detectors just to get in because that's how crazy our schools were. And so I stood in front, and as I was waiting on line, I heard the Holy Spirit say, get out the line. So I got out the line, and I was crying still, tearing up. And he said, Clifford, if you can be ready to die for the Crip gang, if you could be ready to die for this blood affiliation that you had, if you could be ready to die for drugs, if you could be ready to die for all this stuff that you were doing and for these gangs and for all this stuff, you were ready to die for your blue flag. You were ready to die for representing your, 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 your name and who you were. He said, what about me? I was ready to die for you. And it was at that moment I screamed to the top of my lungs, hallelujah! And everybody just turned like, Err. and they looked at me like I was crazy. But at that moment, I was because I lost my mind. And the Bible says you have to get, we have the mind of Christ. And so I literally lost my mind and the mind of Christ came into my, in my mind and became my mind. And I just began to worship God in front of these thousands of kids. I'm talking about white kids, Asian kids, black kids, all nationalities in this school. And I began to worship God in front of these people. And I just burst out crying and saying the praises of God. And it was at that moment people realized Clifford has changed. Clifford is no longer the same. Clifford is not ashamed of Christ. And I was told by people that if I didn't stop preaching the gospel in my school, they would no longer be my friends. And I was like, uh, Bye. <laughs> you know, I was told by this girl that I liked that I smelled like Jesus, you know, and, 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 she, and, and I was like, wow, thank you. That's a compliment to smell like the master of the universe, to smell like Jesus. And she was saying that to me like it was a bad thing, but little did she know she was telling me that I had the fragrance of Christ. That's how much my life exemplified Christ. And literally, I would go back to my neighborhood and I would preach the gospel. And many gang members were getting saved. Crip members were getting saved. There was a time I was bringing about, about 20 gang members to church at a time. And they would be weeping under the gospel. And I would literally be on every street corner in my neighborhood just proclaiming this gospel, sharing my testimony, going from church to church. And the same thing that God said has come to pass. He said, Clifford, I will use you to preach the gospel all around the world. And literally, I've preached in Haiti. I've preached in Canada. I preached in Philadelphia, I preached in New York, I preached, in, I preached literally all over the place. Which brings me to this final testimony. I have to share it. Being on this broadcast right now is simply an act of God. Because I was not supposed to be here. I should have been dead a long time ago, honestly. But as I was in Florida... One of the production members just hit me up on Facebook and said, Clifford, I want you to share your testimony. And he didn't even know what my testimony was. And as we were on the phone, it was not until later that, that, that day we was talking on the phone, we both realized that this had to be divine appointment. This had to be an act of God. But let me tell you why I'm in Florida at this moment. Three years ago, God told me that he was going to send me to Florida, Orlando, Florida, not particularly Orlando, Florida, but that he was going to send me to Florida to preach a certain message. And this message was, this is the year of your jubilee. At the moment, I said, okay, God, I don't know how I'm going to get to Florida. I don't have no connections in Florida. I don't know who you're going to, I don't know how I'm going to get there. But if you are able to get me there, if you say you're going to get me there, I know I'm going. And so, for three years, my uncle, who had a church in Ocala, Florida, was trying to get me to preach at his church. But because God never gave me the okay, I decided to not go. And so he began to be a little upset with me and irritated because he's been trying to get me to preach at his church for three years. But I could never go because God never gave me the okay. And I don't move, I don't move unless God tells me to move. And so three years later, and one day I got a call from one of my friends, a pastor friend of mine. He said, Clifford, I got this church in Florida that you need to preach at, and, and, and I'm going to send you, and I'm going to pay for your ticket. You're going to come out here, and you're going to preach the gospel. And I said, surely this has to be God, because I felt the presence of God finally telling me, this is it. Now you can go to Florida. And so I finally said, I'm going to Florida. I packed my bags. I was heading to Florida. And I remembered in my heart, the Lord gave me a message. He said, you're going to preach. This is the year of your jubilee into, into the church where you, when you go to Florida. When I got to Florida, 
Guess what my friend told me? He said, Clifford, the pastor been preaching about Jubilee. As a matter of fact, this is a 50-day revival symbolizing the Jubilee. And I completely lost it. I began to weep. I began to cry. I said, God told me three years ago that I was going to preach this is the year of your Jubilee when I came to Florida. And literally, it was a 50-day revival that I was completing, and it was called the Jubilee. And that's when I knew that God had a plan for Florida. I began to preach that week in Florida at this church. And let me tell you something. About 40 people got baptized. People, there was this young couple who decided to get married on the day they got baptized. God told me that debts were going to be canceled, major debts were going to be canceled, and numerous were debts were canceled until the amount of $38,000. God told me that he was going to um, pr um, provide somebody with a major check for the church. And guess what happened? Someone wrote a check in the amount of $100,000 to this church. I'm talking about revolution, revival happened at this church. And that is the only reason why I came to Florida. And here I am behind the screen, screen telling you my powerful testimony. I just want to share this with somebody today, that when God says something about you, when God plans something for your life, when God says, I'm going to use you and I'm going to make your name great because I'm going to use you to make my name famous, and, and, and God gives you that, 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 that anointing, he gives you that covering, and then he protects you and he builds a hedge around you so that the enemy won't be able to destroy you. When God says yes, the enemy me and nobody can say no. When God opens the door, nobody can shut it. And when God shuts the door, nobody can open it. I'm telling you, if God said it, it will happen and no one can take that away. God is good. I don't know who's listening to me right now. I don't know where you are, but I went from a drug dealer, a gangbanger turned drug addict, and now I'm literally leading a ministry called P4DM. Problems for the Devil Ministries, which is my stage name as an artist, Problems for the Devil. He gave me that name, and I did not quite understand why, because a lot of people would make fun of me. Even Christians were making fun of me because of that name. I've been laughed at. I've been ridiculed, all for the sake of Christ. I've been punched in my face for the gospel because they didn't want to hear me preach. I've been laughed at. I've been cursed at for the gospel. But so many people have been saved that I said, God, you have called me and I'm going to keep going on. P4DM is now an international ministry. I, like I said, I've preached in Haiti. I've preached all over the world. I've preached in so many different places. And so if God said it, in due time it will come to pass. And I remember this is the theme verse for my ministry. It's, for the kingdom suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Matthew eleven twelve, 12, paraphrasing. He says, the kingdom suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And so I believe that God is raising up a generation of problems for the devil. People, young men, young women, old men, old women, if you are saved, you are a problem for the devil. And a problem for the devil is basically someone who is God's solution to a dying generation. If you are God's hands and feet extended to a dying generation, you are his solution, with automatic, which automatically makes you a problem for the devil. And so I speak life over you today. Wherever you may be seated, wherever you're watching this broadcast, I want to tell you that God has a plan for you. And no matter what the enemy throws at you, it shall come to pass. My name is Clifford Grisseau, and that is my powerful testimony. God bless you.